Thank you again. And thank you, church. Not just showing up, but this is good to be together. Um, we got a big month, not a big month, a big two months, okay? So we got a lot of things going on. I don't know if you know or if you can see, but we're, we're working pretty hard right now. Um, not only the midweek things that we have with our Bible studies and activities and our service projects are beginning, and we're not done. We're bringing down the garden um, in the next two weeks, and we have pumpkins and sweet potatoes and roasting great little squash so we can get those orange colors I don't know what they're called, but they're supposed to be good for us. I put a lot of sugar stuff on top, so I know that's not right, but we have a lot of fun coming up too. Um, The school's getting ready to the fall festival. They just had a great week, a service day for the high school um, this week, and a week of prayer. So um, things are going really well. Um, Again, some of you noticed about the uh, notice last week of Jerry. Dawes, who, um, uh, uh, one of our elders, um, one of those rocks here in this place over the years passed away. And um, you'll see more information about that in the newsletter this week. Um, But no, they'll probably do some sort of a a celebration of life somewhere in March when all the family can be there um, and travel. But that'll be middle of March at that time. But um, our hearts are are um, with Marie and the family, and um, and we're going to miss some of these. uh, Kalama, if there's a a mother of Israel, he would be a father of Israel as well. So I want you to think about one of those favorite movies that finishes really well, okay? You know, when you... have a sense of justice and conclusion and rightness and joy and maybe you got a tear or your heart's pumping or something. Find that favorite movie or some of those movies like that and you just cut the last 20 minutes of that movie and just pretend that it just ends right there. And now you're thinking, oh man, this is not such a great movie. (laughs) Because at the end, the conclusion and some of the best parts are what we call the epilogue. The, that final piece. You know, there's the climax and then there's this moment where it has that um, conclusion. But then afterwards, that's at that epilogue that it makes sense, and there's a sense of rightness. And then there's, thing is going to move the right direction again. Do you know what I'm talking about? When we start to look at the study of the Gospel of John, um, there is an epilogue. And we've gone through several of these stories, these key passages, and we've missed a lot, that that's why in our Sabbath school classes, in our Bible studies, we're going through verse by verse, and it might take another two and a half months to do this, but this is one of the best things that we can do as believers right now, is to go into this particular book. Um, This book of John has all of the unique stories. Um, Some of the other gospels, they share the same stories, maybe have a different look, but in John, you'll find these stories are unique and they're not found in other gospels. Also, the miracles in the conversations are long and developed and sometimes it's filled with theological um, discussions that are deep and often incomplete and unresolved. It's like it's leaving meat on the bone, so to speak. And then there are these great statements, too, that it's not hard to understand what Jesus is saying. It's not complicated. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. 
I am the resurrection of the life. I am the shepherd. I am the light. I am the way, the truth, the life. You cannot get there unless through me. So it's not like a mystery. He's coming out directly and making these declared statements. And it's not mystifying or anything else. It's clear. It's bold. It's direct. And it's beautiful. There's also these words that um, are inside of this book where you'll see over and over the belief word shows up almost a hundred times. Where the other gospels, you'll see eight or nine times the belief or to belief, it shows up 80 to 90, depend on how you're going to translate it, almost a hundred times in the gospel of John. This is the most important thing. This is the verb for the Gospel of John. Will you believe? Do you believe? Other things like relationships and eternal life. And how do you receive this and to know and to be born again? Beautiful passage of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit shows up into this Gospel. Why? More than any other place, it's because now this gospel was written maybe 50 to 60 years after the resurrection. Think through what that means now. All the gospels were written eminently around the time of the emergent church in the book of Acts, but this gospel was written almost 50 years, 60 years after this story finished with the resurrection. Think about that. Now, there are no witnesses anymore. There might be some people, but ultimately, this is a testimony of what really happened. When people are now starting to say, well, did Jesus really show up in in a body? Or was it just a spiritual thing? So these are all the big questions that people are asking in culture. Now think about our um, culture today. Do we have questions about Christianity, the story of Jesus? Our world is looking at that and saying, this is one of many stories that you might believe. But does the Christian story really have a foothold into our world today? There is a question. In all of this, you read this gospel, you'll be confident that this Jesus is not only the creator, he is also our redeemer and our Lord and the one that's gonna come to us through the Holy Spirit and abide into our hearts today as we do his work. To the end. This is that beautiful book that I'm going to have to read this every year. And, and I invite you, as we read the final conclusion and the epilogue, that you'll make a, a decision like that to just keep the story of Jesus close. Let's pray. Lord, as we open your word, deep in our hearts and our minds, See you, there's nothing to see other than you right now. And you're calling into our lives, we pray in your name, amen. Well, if you like photography, and I know some of you do, um, there are shots, and and, and there's a, a, a science and an art with that, but then there's what we call snapshots, right? You just click and you get what you get. And I don't know if you've ever had a picture of you or yourself uh, when you have to delete it quickly because why? The snapshot didn't really catch your face or who you are or how you feel because you're taking a picture and your eyes are doing this. Now, we start doing that. That's not who I am. You know, if I start looking, you know, you get these faces that they're not perfect and they're not really capturing it because it's a snapshot. It's a little different than a portrait. 
Now, I own a portrait of my mother. Now, my brothers were not as fast as me, um, but I wanted to have this portrait. Now, this is a portrait that my mom wanted to get rid of long ago. She does not like this portrait because she is beautiful, Dad. Don't you think so? Do you remember that portrait? Uh, she has that 1960s hair. And she was a styling woman, okay? She looked good. She had the right hair, the clothes, and um, she had great taste. But when she had to sit for a portrait, she was not happy. She did not want to sit and have somebody look at her and paint her. This has got to be one of the worst things that you could do for my mom. And it shows. I mean, if I were to show this, and it's almost disrespectful, I won't do this, but I'm going to bring it in my office if you want to see my mom. Um, it'll be there in a week. But um, you could see her scorn. She has a face, and she's looking directly to the um, artist. And you know those wrinkles right above the forehead? It's because she's about ready to hurt someone. <laughs> she does not want to have her portrait. And I just love it. Because <laughs> I've seen that look before um, when I get in trouble. I could see parts of those little wrinkles in her Face, but what's so important about a portrait? Well, what's different about that in a snapshot? A snapshot, it's, it's click and it's done. It's flat almost. It's immediate. But a portrait, how do you do a portrait? It's because an artist takes a look at a person's face or their body or whatever, and then they now paint. And they make those strokes and those um, movements on the canvas, and then they look back at the face again and look at it again intently, and they're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to have a studied process of a person's aura or their face, to look intently into the subject and imagine those brush strokes on the canvas over and over, back and forth, to get certain features. And some of those um, features are heightened. If you have a long nose or a chin or whatever, you can actually do with it paint that you probably can't capture in digital photography or the traditional one. The Gospel of John is like a portrait, not a snapshot. It's because it's a studied look at the meaning of Jesus in our world. And it's not just a quick shot. This one goes deep into the cracks and crevices and all of the contours of human life. So as we do this, we'll look through this conclusion in John, the story with a little bit of commentary but three truths in the epilogue at the end. Let's do that together in John chapter 1. We'll go back to the final conclusion that I think this chapter had finished, and it was over. Close the book, but then it had to add an epilogue afterwards. But let's take a, a few of those featured moments in John chapter 2. 20, take a look at, open up your Bible, there are a couple clips here on the screen. Um, verse 1, after, not before, but the after part is where we're looking at the resurrection. And Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed. And we should have lights and we have uh, an orchestra, we should be celebrating that a moment when it's there. And in this beautiful um, story, um, she came running to find Simon 
Peter and to the other, the, the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, it says. And, and John is writing this way, um, not just because he's bragging or he's got this thing back and forth with Peter, because Peter's already gone. It's actually a historical reason to put characters that people knew about the story into the text to give this confirmation. So he's using as much detail as possible. Verse 3 and 4, so Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb, and now it might be a little bit funny Both were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached to the tomb first. All right? My brother was always a little faster than me until we got to high school. Then it didn't matter. He could still beat me up, so it doesn't matter. But there's a little something here. Why do we have this detail? Like, is this really salient to the story? That who won the race? Why are these details are now put into this gospel story? You don't see this in other places. It says this. Um, <laughs> we, we go, my favorite part is with Mary. Let's go back to Mary now in verse 16. Now, we go back to the tomb and Mary is there and Mary is just um, at the tomb and he sees that there's these two angels or these white robed people in the tomb and he's not there. And then he comes back and he's looking around and somebody speaks and says, you know, what are you doing here? And says, I'm looking for Jesus. Did you take him somewhere else? And, And he thinks this person is a gardener. Says, what? What did you do? Where did you take him? And then, don't you love this? It's so beautiful. In verse 16, Jesus said her name. And that changed everything. Right when, she, when he said her name, Mary, she turned toward him and cried out in America, Rabbi. You know the word rabbi, it's not just a teacher. It actually means in the, in the Hebrew and in the America, it means my great one. This is ownership. This is mine. It's beautiful. Peter and John running and racing to the place. Mary in that moment has these details. It's just about those little Moments that, like, you were there. And then you go with Thomas, and Thomas captures kind of the thoughts of a lot of people in this world. I need to see more. Remember in Thomas, Thomas says in in verses 19 and 20, he says, peace be with you. And after he said that, he showed his hands and his feet. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. They showed his body. They able to touch him. Why is that included now? Remember, at that time, in about 90 to 100 years after A.D., right now people were thinking that there was no body of Jesus. There was no physical body. That This is a spiritual revolution, and this is coming out with their culture now. They had so many um, myths that were going at that time. You're going to see every moment in these last two chapters, we're going to be able to see Jesus. He's going to appear and leave. You're going to be able to touch him. He's going to say things. He's going to be real things. Why? Because in all of this, the most important story on life is real, touchable. (laughs) Remember what Jesus said after this? He said, um, he said, blessed are those who have not seen and yet still believed. Peter actually would pick up that. 
And he would write in his letter, if you want to write this down and read this first chapter of 1 Peter 1, he says this. It says um, in 1 Peter 1, verse 8 and 9, there's no slide, but let me just read it to you. It says, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and joy, glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. This is the exact desire of the Gospel of John. So Peter is actually talking to church people. says, this is what we're about. It's a perfect ending. And remember, here is the end of chapter two. This is where the gospel we're supposed to end. Right here in verse 31 and 30, uh, 20, verses 30 and 31. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. You ever wonder why about those stories, those things that were so like experiences and, and those things that they'll talk about the, the campfire, but we'll never know until later. He says, but these are all written, these ones that are here. This is why I'm saying, don't let dust on your Gospel of John. This one, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and then by believing that that process of doing that, you will have life. And we were to ask our world today, if you can feel a sense of life that's enduring and full and abundant, would you want it? And our world would say, yeah, that's what I want. My life is empty now. My life is uncertain. My life is empty. But this story speaks directly to that. And that should have been the perfect ending of the Gospel of John. We almost want to give a little clap for John and say, wow, this is great. Good job. This is perfect. We got our marching orders. We have everything we need. We have the resurrection. We have the power. We have the stories. We have the belief. Let's go, right? Why add the epilogue? It's over. It's done. Why did John add another chapter? And, and we know that this is John. Just by over time and the manuscripts and everything, this is John coming back to his work. It's already published. And he comes in there and he has to say, I need to add one more thing. One more thing, and let's read the epilogue. Chapter 21, verses 1 and 2. Afterwards, afterwards, Jesus appeared again to the disciples. By the Sea of Galilee. Where is this? Not Jerusalem. By Galilee. It happened this way. And just get the language again. Simon Peter is there, Thomas is there, Nathaniel is there, the sons of Zebedee, we know those are two guys, right, James and John, and who else? Two other disciples, unnamed. How many? Seven disciples. If you want to go back, in John chapter 1 and count those disciples at the very beginning where Peter was called into service. That first chapter you got seven disciples there. And you can count them. The ones who are not counting and named, you can actually make a case that these seven are back again. I wonder why we do in the epilogue at the end you'd put a scenario by the sea again with Peter with seven disciples. Hmm. Hmm. Can you do that, Malachi? Hmm. He had a mess, mustache the other day, so it looked more. Verse 3. It says, I'm going out to fish. 
I'm going fishing. I got my fishing pole in my, my office right now. It's there. I should have I brought it out there with a little hat. Nobody would believe me because I don't know how to use it. Um, but he said, Peter says, I'm going to go fishing today. This is days after the resurrection. And Peter is doing what? I'm going to go fishing. And they say, well, we'll go with you. Is this strange? So they went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Hmm, right? Has this happened before? They all fishing on the Galilee lake at night, right? Early in the morning, it said Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to him. Friends, have you ever had any fish? Answer, no. Whenever you're fishing, do you like people asking you questions about your success? Even if you're doing well, I don't want them to know. If I'm doing really well, I don't want them coming into my grill. I don't want them into my area. I don't want them into my, my success moment. Can you imagine this guy? <laughs> Have you any fish? The answer, no. <laughs> Flat. But then, look at the next part. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some. I can just imagine Peter. Great. Long night. Didn't get anything. He's out there. And somebody says, yeah, try doing this. He says, great, right. We have another person who's telling us how to. This has happened before, hasn't it? In that moment when he did that, they tried to pull all of this fish, but immediately P knew exactly what was going on. A little quiz. Are you ready for a quiz? I'm going to give you a, a grade at the end, all right? All right, let's do a quiz. Because you read in the text, and if you have it in your Bibles right now, I want you to read ahead in the next few verses. We're going to have a little quiz. Of, uh, there's three questions, okay? All right, are you ready? How many yards did they have to tow the boat with the net filled with fish? Are you ready? Do you have your answer? The answer is almost 100 yards, okay? We're going to round up. When you get to my age, I get to round up. And also evangelists actually calculate that way as well. But <laughs> all right, almost 100 yards far away, they had to pull all of the fish in. That's a football field, right? All right, what did we get for breakfast? Jesus is cooking breakfast, and sorry about the typo, that's not, that's my fault. Um, what did Jesus prepare for food, for breakfast? Two items on the menu, what are they? Why are these details, are there, why does it matter how many yards did it was that they had to tow a bunch of fish in nets that are broken, pulling this thing down? Why are these things are important? Well, what about this one? Even better. Third question. How many fish did the disciples catch? Uh, did you read? How? The professor says, how many? All right, but it's an incomplete answer. I'm sorry. You get an A minus, but what? Large fish, A plus now, sister, thank you. Exactly, and if you're a fisherman, like everything that you catch starts in your mind, it's bigger than you think, right? Um, 
However, why are these details even in there? I wonder, why do the details matter in this story? Notice in the next verse here, in um, verse 14, it says this. It says, this was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Three times. So why are we doing this? Why are we giving these details? We're having a story that's being given to us today. That there is this Jesus who is going to come and go at will. He's going to go into people's places. He's going to touch people. He is going to eat with them. He's going to cook breakfast. He's going to make comments. You're going to have conversations. You're going to be able to see the wounds. And you're going to see him walk away and come back again and again and again. These moments are real. And I wonder, if this is so important for people, it is for us today. Because in John 14 to 16, he promised that there will be moments that I am not here. I have to leave. Why? Because the Holy Spirit can come and dwell into every believer's heart so that wherever that heart is imbued by the presence of Christ, that grace will bring miraculous, wonderful joy and hope into people's lives. That is the calling. And that's the story. And then, in the epilogue, we have not only a fishing moment, we have a cooking moment, we have evidence moment for his real body is there, but then we have the conversation between Peter and Jesus. And I would suggest, it's not just because John is a good friend with Peter, a co-laborer, but I do believe that if this is done, Peter has already been passed. He has already been crucified He has already seen the flourish of the church, put his life on the line, and at the end of Peter does exactly what he would say in the beginning when he failed, is that he died for his Lord. It needs to have an epilogue that has something about Peter. Not just because of Peter as a bro or a friend, or a colleague, but because Peter is like everybody else who will come along the line, who will need to be able to see, like Mary and Peter, to see and know and touch this person. He says, do you love me, Peter? (laughs) And he says, yes. Feed my sheep. He repeats this three times. And this breaks his heart because he knows exactly why he's asking it three times. And you can understand now. Verses 19 and verse 22, you have Jesus saying, after this inquiry. Follow me. Or in verse (laughs) verse 22, you must follow me. Right? In the end of the epilogue, it says this. Because everything has been said now. The connections are made There is, um, these stories seem to repeat again. Peter is called by the sea. 
The disciples are there, the same disciples maybe. This fishing experience is the similar. All the things that Jesus heard Peter said, that I'll do this, and when he denied and restored again, there's a fire, there's food, like the supper. The, the whole thing is smacked with this intentional story for all of us, not them, but today. It says in verse 24, this is the disciple who testifies to the things that wrote down. We know that this testimony is true. And Jesus did many other things, and every one of them were written down. I suppose the whole world would have room for the books that were written, period. It's over. When I look at this, I look at a few things. Number one, the before and after of the event. I see the sightings and the appearance. This is a verifiable thing. This is one of those things that makes sense for a logical researcher person. They want to know that this has a his, like, um, historical significance to this. But these also are conversations that are very ordinary too, with details that are in the moment. Those are beautiful stories. And this question is, heightens this whole thing to the point it's all about a relationship between Jesus and us. So this is never going to be a theology about a doctrine or approach or a practice. This is all going to be about a relationship between us and Jesus. And then, fourth, I was looking at these tasks. These are normal things that we do every day. I love that in the epilogue, this looks like it could have happened today. I love that. Because I need that same Jesus into my life today as it was back then. Add that chapter in there. It's fine if it's not, but this makes sense for us today. There are three things at the end that it's unmistakable and true. Okay? Okay? I know, you don't like seeing this, okay? You get an F. But it's a good F. It's the best one. At the end, we see the story. And this is my PowerPoint. I want you to see. That you're forgiven. This whole story is all set up for this moment when Jesus called from the the sea, on the beach, into the sea, and he says, come for breakfast. He didn't have to ask any questions to Peter. He knew at that moment he was what? He was forgiven. Because in the Middle Eastern culture, if you ever enter into a meal with another person, there is no conflict. There is no argument. There is no hate. You, if you're sitting at the table, this grace has already blessed the relationship. You are brothers now. And that's how it works. But Peter knew. But he needed to answer these questions. And you can hear about people were saying with this agape love and, and, and those words are interchanged all through the New Testament. Sometimes the phileo is used for a relationship between Jesus and, and the Father. So it's, it's not always agape. Sometimes it's brother and sister. But it's still love, and it has the same impact in three questions. So, what does it change in our lives and, and in our days if we start the day knowing that we are called um, in this moment, we're already forgiven. That this is already done for you. But what does it do for us today to know 
that on our worst moments that we are already forgiven. You ask because you need to, and the same reason why I need to say I love you. I have it in my heart, but when I say it, something happens in there. We have to do that, but it's done. What a great life to live today if we know that we are forgiven. I know, don't ever get two in your port card. Not even one. Let me do this one. The second one is the fellowship. That they're working together in that everyday moment. After the resurrection, what are they doing? They know that the resurrection, this big event is there. What are they doing? Fishing. Eating. Talking. Doing normal, everyday life. And we'll have to go back from those big moments and you're gonna have to go back to work. You're gonna have to go back to your bills. You're gonna have to go back to your studies. But that doesn't change the fact that what just happened makes meaning out of our fellowship. We have a lot of moments that are gonna be big moments and then there's gonna be ordinary moments. But this is one beautiful truths that comes right in that last moment. And the last one is you're fruitful. You are called not to just agree or believe. You're actually being asked to go forward and to be an ambassador of that same grace. You are promised, feed the sheep. Why? Because he's a leader? No, it has nothing to do with that. A, a person who um, takes care of the sheep is somebody who cares for each other. It creates safety, something very beautiful. He says, you will produce. Remember the, in John chapter 14, verse 12, he said this, and I said this to the students. I said, if there's anything that Jesus ever said to me that I don't believe immediately, it's this verse. And they said, what? I said, read it, and you see how crazy it is. Whoever believes in me, you will do the things that I do. <laughs> do you do that? Are any of you going to go into the nursing home and grab the first person into the wheelchair and pull them out and say, uh, stand up and dance. It's your day. Anyone doing that? And maybe you could, but ultimately, is that what you're doing? Is anybody fixing leprosy or uh, raising the dead? Is anybody going to go to the memorial service at the graveside this afternoon and just stop in there and, and interrupt? And it says this, if you believe in me, you'll do the same things that I do. And in fact, he says, you'll do even greater things. Do you buy that? It doesn't work in my mind until I understand that Peter is sitting there, who denied Jesus, was forgiven, and goes into Pentecost when there's only a handful of people three weeks ago, there's 120 that shows up in the upper room. What shows up at Pentecost? 3,000. And the book of Acts says every day they started coming. Talk about fruitful. The church has exploded. Even when Nero and Benicius are taking out Christians left and right, what happens? The story was more true to people when they were being persecuted. What happened? It grows. And today that promise is for us as well. So I invite you. Come on up. Um, just invite you to that beautiful moment every morning.
to just trust in that grace that's given and that forgiven standing with your God. Write it down. Forgiven already. Changes everything. Do not disconnect from the community. We need each other. And this is how we flesh out this great, good gospel in our lives. And as we do that, we'll see. We'll see what God do. The great things. And do and work and feel. And, and we'll even sing well um, in the coming, coming days. And then as the Lord comes... He'll give that promise um, to be true for all of us on that day. Let's sing.